And um, good morning to everyone. I would like to start out by saying that I am not an expert on procrastination, but I am a highly experienced procrastinator. So that gives me a platform to speak from. I am broadcasting to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, but I am originally from California on the lands of the Yokuts people where this Polaroid was taken. So this is when I was nine years old, and this is the year that I got my first short haircut, and it was the year that I learned how to sew. So a very big year, and probably you could say this is the start of my mending career. This is me in 2013 when I first started mending in public. So the year before, I had quit a nearly 20-year career in journalism. And three months later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I'm fine now, but I had this whole, um, like a life crisis of trying to figure out what my purpose was. And I had no idea. So at the time, all I could think of was to do little bite-sized projects that were interesting to me because I couldn't, it was too big a problem to solve. So I started doing pop-up repair workshops that were free in a cafe in Melbourne. And this is me at one of those events. And that's me with John, who was one of the mechanical fixers that we had. And if you've ever heard of Repair Cafe, it's a very similar concept. So it's a free community event. People who have broken things bring their stuff. And people who are sort of expert fixers will help guide them through the process of repairing those things. These events were super, super popular. And it was the first time that I realized that people get really, really excited about repairs, like in a way that is maybe not even justified. And I started to notice something is going on here. Carolyn brought these oven mitts to one of those events. And originally, I don't have a before picture, but originally they were all that pale red color. And there were two chunks missing out of the top. She would burned holes in the oven mitts when she was baking some bread. And she said, can you fix these? What do we do? And I knew that I could fix them so that they were functional, but I didn't know how to fix them invisibly. I didn't know how to restore them back to the original condition. And then I had this idea, what if I made them look like they were dipped in denim? And it was the first time that I'd ever tried creative mending. And it was the first time that I'd ever realized you don't have to make things invisible and you can actually make things better than new in the process of mending them. Uh, Carolyn loves these oven mitts. And this picture was actually taken, I think, four years after I repaired them. So you can see like they've been very well loved. And she told me that she definitely loved them more than she originally did. Um, a few years later, I started doing mending commissions professionally and actually getting paid for it. Some of the reasons why I procrastinate include that I hate the task or that I am waiting for inspiration or I think the task is going to take way longer than it actually is going to take or that I am becoming a perfectionist. And the worst is not even comparing my work to other people, but comparing my work to past work that I have done. And Instagram is particularly bad for this. If you like set a certain bar for yourself and people expect things and then you're like, oh, what if what I make is not as good as what I've made before and people are going to hate it, right? I procrastinate to stay in my comfort zone and to avoid the bad feelings. But I'm not the only one who procrastinates. According to Dr. Tim Pitchell, who is an actual procrastination expert, unlike me, procrastination is an emotion regulation problem, not a time management problem. We procrastinate to avoid horrible feelings like boredom, anxiety, insecurity, frustration, resentment, and self-doubt. Um, fun fact, Dr. Tim Pitchell is giving a Creative Mornings Ottawa talk on the procrastinate theme later today, if you want to watch that. One of my big procrastination triggers is when I'm stuck on something and I don't know how to solve the problem. So I'm waiting for the answer to like magically appear, right? 
which I've learned is a universal procrastination trigger. How do I know this? Let's go back to the fix it workshops. These are some shorts that were owned by Blake, the barista who was at the cafe where I ran these events. And he said, can you fix my shorts? So I did, and then I posted these pictures online. And the following week, we had 12 people come with shorts with identical problems, same hole, same deal. And they're like, can you fix my shorts? And I said, no, but I can teach you how to use a sewing machine and you can fix your shorts. And um, we cannot imagine a solution sometimes. Sometimes we don't know that it's even possible until we see someone else do it, until we see that a solution actually exists, right? After the Fix It workshops, I launched a social enterprise called Bright Sparks. And we repaired, reused, and recycled electrical appliances to keep them out of landfill. This is when I really started to care about the environment because I saw behind the scenes of a charity and I saw just how much stuff that we create, like how much waste we create and how much we donate. And it's one thing when you donate your own stuff and you think you're doing good, but it's another when you see the multiples and you see everyone's stuff. And I started to think about these bigger problems. And I've written a story about the experience called Lessons from Bright Sparks, if anyone's interested about that. But while I was at Bright Sparks, I made up this term called cupboard procrastination syndrome based on what I kept hearing people tell me. Basically, it's when you have broken things and you don't know how to fix them or where to take them to recycle them. So you shove them in a cupboard because you don't want them to go into landfill, but you don't know what the solution is and you're waiting for it to magically appear. And I thought this was just kind of a funny thing. Like I love playing with words and, um, and I didn't think much of it. But then it seemed to really resonate with people. And once people discovered Bright Sparks and the solution, they would drive more than two hours to visit us. We actually had a lady mail us stuff from Hobart to relieve her cupboard procrastination syndrome. And Bright Sparks ended up with more stuff than we could actually handle. The Age ran a story about Bright Sparks, and they used cupboard procrastination syndrome in the headline. And this was on the front page of the Age website. Like they've even shortened it to CPS. So that's when I realized it's real, it's a thing. It really does happen. Another term that I made up that I thought I was just, you know, a throwaway word was procrastinating. There's a passage in my book um, from a section called Thoughts Before Mending that I would like to read for you. Before I mend anything, I run through a mental checklist to help me decide how to tackle it. Here's my usual approach. One, come up with too many mending ideas or some risky ideas and take months to decide how to proceed. Two, postpone mending the item for as long as possible, occasionally to the point where it no longer fits me. Three, finally start mending. Whee! Four, decide I hate how it looks and undo my handiwork. Five, start again with a different method or material. We freak out and wonder if this is my greatest mend ever or a very bad idea and I'm ruining my clothes. Six, finish mending and be genuinely surprised to discover that the mended garment is now my favorite item of clothing ever. Seven, wear it all the time and enjoy the compliments. Eight, repeat as necessary. Look, I didn't say it was a good approach, but I wanted you to know that I get nervous too. It's part of the process sometimes and you have to push through to get to the favorite thing stage. I'd like to share a few pictures of items that I've procrastinated to help paint the picture. Lita's cat ripped her dress and she asked me to fix it. I freaked out because for a rip like this, I could think of a hundred different ways to mend it. And Lita did not help. She said, anything you do will be great, which just makes it worse, right? This is when you're comparing yourself to your past work and you're like, ah, oh, what do I do? And it took me ages to figure out how to approach it. And then the suggestion of experimenting because she basically, Lita gave me a gift. 
she didn't care what I did and she thought it was going to be great. So, so I flipped it. And instead of being anxious about it, I went, oh, I'm going to do something bonkers because my other clients won't let me do bonkers things. So I made an imaginary apology flower from the cat using this, um, the rip as the stem of the flower. And Leah totally loves it. And I'll show you, this is what it looks like in its full dress form. And this is the culprit inspecting the repairs to his handiwork. Apparently he was very sorry. He didn't mean it, but that's what she says. Emma's tea towel had icy poles all over it. That was the design. And it had this one giant hole. I had the opposite problem with this mend because I only had one idea. Naturally, a cockatoo eating an icy pole, right? Of course. Uh, but I had no idea how to do it. And drawing is not one of my strong skills. It terrifies me. So I sat on this forever because I was like, I can't, there's nothing else that I can do. I have to make this, but I literally do not know how I'm going to make this. So eventually I begged my husband to draw a cockatoo for me. And then I used that. I cut out the pieces of the piece of paper and used those as templates to make the fabric pieces, but I couldn't do it on my own. When I repaired the tea towel a second time for my book, it had way more holes in it. And I did not have the strength in me to make another cockatoo. But also I didn't want it to be, um, I wanted it to be a feature. I wanted it to be the strongest thing about the mend. So I ended up going with these drips instead. So it was much simpler. And also if the, if the tea towel gets more holes in future, it's much easier for either me or Emma to keep the repairs going and to not give up on it. So I'm always thinking about that too. When I'm mending stuff for clients, I'm thinking, how is this gonna be mended in future? Is it gonna be something that's replicable? Is there like a theme that I can start to help make it easier to keep going in future? I posted a picture of this stripy shirt that I mended online and Hillary contacted me and said, can you mend my stripy shirt? Are we noticing a theme that like people don't know how to fix things until they see there's actually like a solution? So uh, I said, oh, okay, well, let me have a look. And then she sent me this picture and I went, oh God, have you been mauled by a tiger? And I named this shirt Large Marge after a movie character that describes the worst accident I ever seen. Um, it's terrible. And I had so many people get angry at me and say, do not in that shirt that's rags like it's not even worth it so um the worst hole there were holes everywhere and damage everywhere but the shoulders were the worst so I avoided those until the end because I didn't actually know how I was going to fix them so I attacked this one by just starting and going bit by bit and leaving the shoulders for the very end but the momentum carried me there because once I'd started I've kind of started a theme you know and, there, um, and I could make the shoulders to match everything else that I'd already done. And now Marge is my most famous mint. Marge came back for the book. I had to re-photograph her and she had a hole in the elbow. So I gave her a tattoo. Again, my only idea. So thank goodness that Hillary was like, yeah, let's do it. Cause otherwise it would have been a big fat trouble. And now um, this is what Marge looked like. I love the idea that Marge is the poster girl for possibility and that people show pictures of Marge to their friends and say, this is what visible mending is. Because whatever you probably think it is in your mind, it doesn't have to be that. It can be this, you know, you can do, you can transform things that you might not even thought possible. This Marge definitely changed my idea of what is mendable. So now I'm constantly pushing that and going, well, how far can I take this? You know, what actually is rags and what's worth pursuing. Uh, this was my husband's puffer jacket. And this hole was the little feathers were doing like this wispy thing. And they were talking to me every time we'd go on walks during lockdown, they would go me, 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 me. Like, and I just couldn't stand it, but it took me months, months. Right. And then I decided I'm going to make this an educational opportunity. So I'm gonna time this and see how long it actually takes me to do it. So it took me 19 minutes to find the jacket, the scissors and the repair tape 
and to set up my tripod and camera to take the before photos. It took me three and a half minutes to make the cross out of repair tape. And then it took me another three minutes to remove that cross and make a smaller one because Matt thought it was too big. <laughs> so like, seriously, we're talking 26 minutes and it was like months and months of waiting. I don't So I wanna share um, some of my tricks that I've developed to fight procrastination. Obviously, as you know now, um, I still do it, right? So I'm not perfect, but I do have a few tools in my toolkit when I need to get things done. And the first one is peer pressured productivity. This is my secret sauce. I started attending something called side project sessions after I heard about it at a creative morning talk. And basically it um, uses what's known as the Pomodoro method. So it's short bursts, work sprints. And there are similar, um, similar initiatives elsewhere. And they do anything from like 25 minutes of deep fo focused work to like 55 minutes. But you have a timer. No one talks on their phone. No one talks to each other. It's totally silent. And you have to focus and get stuff done. I got more book writing done at side project sessions in three hours than I did on a whole day left to my own devices or may, sometimes even a week. Like it's embarrassing how productive I was doing this. This is my editor, Coco. She saw me speak at a side project sessions event, which led to my book deal. Side project sessions isn't running anymore, but there are similar initiatives or you could try to set up your own. It's pretty simple to do really. It's just the key element is you need other people there to scare you and to make it work. And um, I wrote some of this presentation in a local council program called Write Club. And I also wrote some of it in an international Zoom session by a group called Cave Day. So there's all kinds of things out there if you're interested. Next tip, scary deadlines make you feel alive. If you need to feel alive, if you're not feeling anything, try a scary deadline. It's amazing how productive you can be when you have a legally binding deadline, like a book contract. I spent two years writing my book, but I really hustled in the last six months when the official deadline was set. Your scary deadline could be a deadline set by a client, or maybe you're motivated by the, client, uh, the climate emergency or the possibility of another lockdown. It's a lot easier to make progress on a goal when you have some sense of urgency in mind. Also, breaking down projects into chunks, each with its own mini deadline, is super helpful for me. So this Creative Mornings talk was amazing because the team built a whole bunch of mini deadlines into it. So I couldn't just wait until the very end and procrastinate and then just, you know, get it done. Like we, there were actual things set in place, which really, really helped for me, especially when those deadlines came from other people and I didn't set them myself. So I run an online shop called modernmending.com, which I launched as the same time as my book last year. I'd had the idea for a shop for a long time, but didn't do anything about it. And then I wrote into my book that you should visit my online shop before the shop existed. I had about three months to get it all set up. And that is a really good way to feel alive. The book launched and sold out last year. And I asked my publisher um, if I could add extra pages to it, because I kind of wanted to do like a director's cut. And there was a lot of stuff that I couldn't fit in the first time. So they said yes. And the second edition with 36 extra pages came out in February. The German edition came out last month and the UK and US editions are coming out soon. This is Claire's jacket. When I was making extra content for the second edition, I totally procrastinated on this jacket because it was the scariest and the most challenging of everything. The repairs on the outside needed to be waterproof. I had never made waterproof fabric before. Um, my original plan was that I was gonna cover all the damaged areas in the pink striped bias binding that you see on the cuffs. But then once I actually started mending it, it was just too much. It was like a sea of pink stripes and it didn't look right. And I started to do my freak out thing that I do. So I avoided the jacket until I came up 
with a solution, which was use a different fabric entirely. And that's where the blue triangles came in. The lining was completely ripped too, and I had never repaired lining before. So um, a slightly terrifying mending job, and now arguably my greatest mend. Another tip, prepare for battle. What do I mean by battle? Well, um, prepare for discomfort and create a strategy to minimize it. Be kind to future you. I am always doing things for future Erin because I love her. The procrastination struggle is real. And if you just pretend that it's not going to happen, that is very silly. So I have all kinds of strategies in place to help future Erin get past whatever she's going to be struggling with. This is Anxious Frog. He is a character that I created who features in my book in the <laughs> troubleshooting sections called What Could Go Wrong? If you can imagine what might go wrong, you can be prepared to deal with it and keep on going. I like to listen to radio station PBS FM, which is a local Melbourne station, but it streams around the world, if anyone's interested. On Wednesdays, they have all of my favorite shows, including Malt Shop Pop and Soul Time. And so I like to schedule really boring accounting and admin tasks on Wednesdays because then I know that they're going to get done and I'm going to be much happier about it and not have those bad feelings associated with the whole thing. I took all the photographs for my book, nearly all of them. And I took all the tutorial photos using both of my hands in the frame. So I ended up creating, with the help of my husband, this foot-powered remote control so that I could take all the photos. And I took them at night using this light box so that I could have consistent lighting, which meant far less editing time, much more consistency. But I am not a night person and I get really grumpy and tired really easily and I lose my mojo. So during the day, I would prepare for battle by packing little like lunch boxes full of props that I was gonna need for the nighttime photo shoots so that when it actually came to nighttime, I couldn't complain and be like, oh, it's too hard, I just wanna go to bed because my pillow was talking to me every night. Boxes also make things tidy and cat proof. These are some prop boxes that I put together for the second edition. And each of these boxes contained all the elements that I might need for the pages in this section, which is called This Goes With That. Another thing that really helps is to share your work. Also to share your problems and your frustrations. Don't just like take this on your own, right? You have to talk to people to make it better. I recently joined in an Instagram challenge called Mend March and managed to do 25 out of 31 prompts. Previous years, I think I got like two prompts done. But this year, for whatever reason, once I started, I couldn't stop. And the momentum carried me through. And I just had like all this motivation. And it kind of felt like I was competing with myself. It was a very strange energy. It was like, I have to do it because Aaron did it. And now future Aaron has to do it and like continue the work. Most of the things that I fixed during Mend March had been sitting in my mending mountain for ages, like this jumper cuff, for like literally just sitting there for ages, not doing anything about it. And now I think this ended up getting more likes than I've ever got on Instagram, which is kind of funny. It was like, wow, I probably wouldn't even have done that. I also got to show off some invisible men's like this jumper vest or sweater vest. Um, and I don't normally share invisible men's on Instagram. So this gave me a really good opportunity to do it. And I also got to show the number one mending problem I get asked about, which is crotch blowouts. I know there's probably a bunch of people here who are thinking about it, but yeah, no, like the before and after is not as exciting. So it's not usually something that I show. So this gave me an opportunity to do that. This was really fun. The theme for this one was my year indoors. And so I got to tell a really fun story about this dressing gown that I got and how my cat had destroyed it and how I repaired it and the whole thing. And it was, it was, the prompt gave me an opportunity to do a bit of storytelling in a way that I wouldn't have done on my own. You know, I get into these like routines with social media and it's sometimes it just seems like a chore. But with this, it was like, 
oh, I can have a bit of fun with it and do something that's a little bit different. This dress needed alterations. The pockets were too high and the dress was way too short. If I hadn't been swept up in the men's march momentum, I know this dress would have sat in my closet for months or maybe even a year and I wouldn't have been able to wear it. This tote bag was covered in cat hair because it had been sitting on top of my mending mountain for two years. It took me about four hours to wash it and fit it with new grommets. I can't believe I'm telling you all these things. This is like super embarrassing. This is the quickest mend of my life. This took 10 seconds. I bought this in the as is section of Uniqlo. It had a glue stain on it. And I thought if I don't take on that challenge, nobody's going to because like I'm the mending lady, right? So game on. And then I went to start soaking it in the sink and just the water with no soap or scrubbing, it just like surrendered and gave up and the glue was gone. And I was so angry because I was like ready for a battle and it just didn't happen. There's so much stuff that I put off dealing with because I think it's going to be a full on battle and it's not. Like I invent this stuff in my mind. Another way to get unstuck is to share the problem and ask for help. I run a Facebook group called Modern Mending Club, which is super friendly and full of menders from around the world. And, and I ended up fixing these saggy socks because someone else posted a technique in the group about how to fix them with elastic thread. I didn't even know that was possible. Is that same old chestnut, that same old theme of until we see a solution, we can't even imagine that one might be possible. If I had not participated in Men March this year, who knows when or if I would have mended either of these things. When we travel outside our comfort zones, that's when the good stuff happens, right? The great things, not just the good things. Procrastination is not just laziness or lack of focus. Sometimes it is actually a sign that there's great stuff on the horizon, but sometimes it hurts to get there. It's not a comfortable path all the time, you know? But that's okay. Not everything has to be comfortable or easy. The great stuff usually is not. And I have a proposition for all of you artists, creative types, artists at heart who are watching this. We need you. The planet needs you. The repair movement needs you to help lead the way. Now that we know that people will not do things until they see solutions, we need your imaginative brains. We need you to become menders so that you can think of really fun, interesting, beautiful, creative ways to do things. Yes, everyone is creative, but not everyone is used to flexing that creative muscle, right? So if you can show people what's possible, then they're going to want to join you too. And then we save the planet. The end. You can find me on the interwebs in various places, but these are the easiest ways to find me. Over to you, Miss Jessamy. Thank you so much, Erin. That was just as amazing as I knew it was going to be. And thank you for sharing all of your, I was going to say embarrassing, but they're not because everyone does it. The, the realities of the like two year versus 25 minute <laughs> men's. These, oh, where am I? These Keith Herring dogs that are on my door, I bought from um, the gift shop at NGV after the Herring um, Basquiat exhibition about two years ago probably, and they sat on my desk for 18 months. We moved house. <laughs> so lucky I didn't put them up because I was telling myself it's going to take ages, it's going to be this whole thing. It took literally five minutes and I was like, yeah, oh, <laughs> probably could have done that two years ago. So, mate, you are in good company. Do not worry. <laughs> we all do it. That's the thing. And I think it makes people feel... That's why I'm telling you about my warts, because I know you all have warts and you all have horrible things you don't want to share, but it's good to know that we all do it, right? 
100%. And you probably, because you were busy talking, didn't see all of the like, oh my God, me too. That's me coming through in the chat. But you are 100% in good company. Everyone is like, yep, totally. That's speaking to High five, heart. everyone. High five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, We'll see what questions are coming through in the chat, but in the meantime, um, I love this idea of, of being able to see the solution. And I was just wondering if you had come across any ideas for how you could kind of hack that in a way. Do you know what I mean? So like if we don't necessarily have an errand to follow or know where to find that solution, I mean, can is it something we can draw for ourselves? Is there, you know... Like how would we go about visualising something or finding a way to visualise a solution? Oh, I've got two answers to that. One is I have a Pinterest board with mending inspiration and I think oh, at least 2,000 pins, we might be up to 3,000 now. Um, and I'm Erin Lewis Spitz on Pinterest. It's amazing. And the best part about the Pinterest board is that it has all different types of styles. Everyone has their own visible mending aesthetic. So sometimes it's not just about the functional, but it's like, I'm going to have to wear this thing. I don't see any examples of what I like or like what would make me happy. So the Pinterest board has so many, it's almost has like too many options and you can find things where you're like, Oh, that's really, you know, that looks like something that I actually want to try. And so I think that's definitely very helpful if you're getting started. The other thing I would say is I don't necessarily take inspiration from other menders. Sometimes I do, um, but most of my inspiration comes from completely different areas. So I love like Japanese embroidery books and um, I collect books from like all around the world, but sometimes I get inspiration from um, like patching from the art world, you know, so it might be for you. Don't necessarily look to what other people in your industry are doing, but go to the museum go to the gallery. Like, you know, um, when I went to Japan, I remember saying this place, it's a gift for my eyeballs. Go to somewhere that is a gift for your eyeballs that is going to like bring new information in a way that you had not thought about it. And it kind of like pushes you out of your box and makes you think about, oh, how could I incorporate that into the work I do? A gift for your eyeballs. I love it. I love it. Interestingly, um, just the other day, I was in a session that was about mentoring, totally different subject, but same kind of thing came up that, you know, look for, for mentors and inspiration outside your industry, outside the thing that you would normally go to, because it pushes you to think outside the box a little bit and you'll come up with solutions you wouldn't necessarily have thought of if you were just talking to people like you. So I love that. Mm. Um, I, my dad, who's actually on this call with us this morning, has been working hard uh, mm. getting through, my dad, uh, <laughs> a bunch of um, cleaning up that he has been putting off for, for many, many years. And he was telling me, um, I can't remember who it was, maybe, Dad, you could put it in the chat, but there's a, a writer who employed someone to be their babysitter to just come over and make sure that they sat down and wrote for the day so dad is having um his partner come over and just like make sure that he did stuff so I, I love that um idea of, of groups or however you know that works for you to be able to get you to actually do stuff when other people are around I find that too like it's amazing just going somewhere and having accountability to someone else or knowing that you will be seen if you start pairing your socks <laughs> Um, makes such an enormous difference. Um, and it's so cool to know that these things exist all around the place. Mm. That's great. Um, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Erin? You can either pop them in the chat or we can unmute you if you would like to ask like a, um, like a real human. <laughs> Um, I would love to know, Erin, what your experience was like with procrastination in 2020 when we were locked down and if you found it better, worse. <laughs> Did it have uh, an impact? Um, 
so my book came out in 2020 and and the shop opened and um re- those things both happened right before we got locked down the first time and lockdown made everyone want to mend so i was just like the number of talks that i had to do or not i shouldn't say have like it was a joy but they just like kept coming the requests and um teaching workshops online and then having to process shop orders and people would say oh you must have got so much mending done and i got nothing done no men like maybe one thing got mended last year i just facilitated others mending um but when when i found out about the possibility of the second edition they basically gave me like four months to do it and i it was right when we were starting lockdown two and i just kind of had that like all right, bring it universe. Let's do it. Like, what else am I going to do during lockdown? You know? So it, so I actually, last year, I probably worked harder than I've ever had to work in my life, but it wasn't necessarily on the things I thought I was going to be working on. If that makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to go, all right, this is what we're doing. It's going to work. But it's been, it was a joy to do men March because I had so much stuff piled up. It was like, it was so nice to just mend for me. Yeah, that's so lovely. There's something similar called Inktober with drawing. I must admit, I intend to do it every year and then uh, never do. But (laughs) um, again, those things are just having that accountability and the sharing thing. I thought that was a really, really um, important point as well um, to keep you accountable. Okay, a couple of questions through the chat. As someone who wears so much black and wants to mend with black, what would you recommend? Oh, black is very special in the mending world. So black, I tell my students black is the jackpot, right? So it is like if you have not so great eyesight or your lighting situation is not great, black can be very challenging, especially black on black. It's very hard to see what you're doing and get frustrated. But also it's black on black and nobody's going to see what you did. So there's like there's a it's kind of like riding a roller coaster if you're like into riding roller coasters it can be like super fun and you just like go with it so um there's all kinds of um you know black fabric and mending yarn and thread and all kinds of things so just embrace it like if you're cool with black just keep mending it in black it's fine and then just know that nobody's gonna see how crappy your handiwork is if it's crappy so you just it kind of releases that um a little bit of pressure which is awesome That's quite uh, relevant to the second question, which is around how do I summon up courage when I'm only a very beginner sewer? Oh, well, I wrote my book for like eight years old and up. So, and I've taught four-year-olds how to sew. This is totally possible. Um, I should make a disclaimer and say, not everyone is physically able to bend, but most of us have some way that we can do it. And I do talk about like, different, you know, there's different kinds of like lighting setups that you can get different kinds of scissors that are like better to hold and ergonomic. There are certain things that you can do if you have, like, you don't have fine motor control. There are all sorts of workarounds that you can do it. And um, the number one thing that I suggest anyone who's scared and wants to start is mend your socks. No one is going to see your ugly handiwork inside your shoes, unless you're like, if you live in a share house, full of really snooty people and it's a shoes off house, then I can't help you. Maybe you might have to like have an intervention and bring them on board, but otherwise you should be totally fine to practice in private and not have anyone know. And the best way to force yourself to darn your socks is to go on a sock fast and not buy any new socks. And that's pretty much what I've been doing for years. Like with the occasional, every couple of years I'll buy a pair, but otherwise you just have to stare at your holy socks and go, well, something's like someone's going to have to win this fight. You can't be at a standstill forever. So is it going to be me or is it going to be the socks? And then you actually have to do something about it. I love that sock fast. Which it's, and you're doing these questions one into the other so beautifully, Erin. I barely even have to ask them. I will ask it anyway, just in case you have anything else to add to it. Um, the question was, what if I open the cupboard and all the men worthy clothes fall on top of me at one time? How do I pick where to start? Oh, that happens to me. You can't see, but right behind this fabric is my mending cupboard. It's not a mountain anymore. I got a proper cupboard. 
but it's huge and it's like, and it's not even stable. So sometimes if I open the door, like I have to watch out because the stuff will fall. Um, so that doesn't really help answer the question, does it? No, but again, start with socks. Start it's with like, socks. It's the, and also like all, the other thing I recommend is tea towels. I love tea towels. And I think they're most affordable form of art that you can have in your home, right? You can go like El Cheapo tea towels, disgusting old stained raggedy things, or you can go like third drawer down tea towels, you know, like there's a whole spectrum, but I love mending them because again, it's one of those things where you can really have a play and explore and try different things, but it's a tea towel. And they get washed and worn so often. So you can see like, are my men's going to be robust enough to, to withstand washing and drying? And what happens? Like, did I choose the right materials? Oh, maybe this shrunk a bit more than I was expecting, you know? So it's a, it's a really good sort of like mini science experiment to work on your tea towels. And nobody's going to laugh at you if you have a mended tea towel. And if they do, just tell them to come to me and I'll tell them to shut up. <laughs> I love it. Low pressure mending. And Joe has a story to share about mending. We'd love to hear from you, Joe. Uh, Tiff, if we could unmute Joe, that would be fabulous. I can unmute myself. Oh, you can. Great. <laughs> um, uh, hello, good morning, and um, thank you very much, Erin. This is my first creative morning. I, I, um, I'm down in talking. <laughs> I have been, I had prior to the pandemic, I had been um, meaning to get up to Melbourne. Anyway, uh, I, I digress. I just wanted to, I just mentioned um, uh, in the chat about mending being a, a third world, well, like quite common in the third world. And when I was traveling in Latin America, I sat on my sunglasses and the, um, the arm snapped off. And um, we were at a market somewhere in Bolivia and there was a man there and he had like a little um, bottle, like a metal bottle cap of kerosene and he set it on fire and he fixed my sunglasses. And I just remember thinking, this is so good. And it just struck me how wasteful we are in the first world with regards to, um, you know, as soon as it's ripped or it's got a hole in it or it's broken. Uh, and there was something else I was going to say. Oh, the other thing is, Erin, um, I re recently acquired a darning mushroom from my mom. She had two. And I, I, I'm so proud that I've done my first darning. <laughs> I've been a sewer all my life, but I was like, I'm not going to get rid of them. I love those socks. So, yeah, so now I'm darning. <laughs> yeah. But I'm inspired to do your obvious darning now. So, yeah. I do. I just want to clarify. I do do invisible mending for myself and I teach it, but I have a rule that I only offer visible mending for clients because then it makes it more fun for me. And then I don't have to fix broken zippers because <laughs> they're like the worst thing ever. It's true. But um, Joe, you just hit on something that's a really good point to mention. Like um, I started mending before I started caring about the environment. It was just a thing, like it was in my skill set and it was a thing that I knew how to do. But the thing that I didn't mention is that you get serious endorphins from fixing stuff. Like, and and that's another reason I advocate like socks and tea towels and the quick wins, like the rush that you get, it's addictive. Like it's awesome. So I'm not just saying, come on, artists, come to the environmental side and help save the planet. Woo, woo, woo. I'm like, no, like this, you want to get in on this. This is like some good feelings that you really need to be experiencing. Like it's not like anything else. I love it. Let's all like get high off mending. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much, Erin, um, and for everyone for asking questions and contributing. And thank you so many um, for so many people having their cameras on this morning. It really makes a big difference to the vibe of the session, so I really, really appreciate that. Um, so a couple of takeaways, get a Pinterest board, start with socks and tea towels, and, of course, buy Erin's book. We are going yeah. to... <laughs>
<laughs> to head into some breakout groups now. We're going to have a bit of a chat. Maybe you've got some mending stories to share. Um, maybe you want to share something that you are currently procrastinating. Maybe you want to talk about setting up a group to um, remain accountable to each other. So we'll pop off now for seven minutes in breakout groups. For those of you who are leaving us now, thank you so much for joining us. We will be back next month again via Zoom. Um, for those of you in breakout groups, um, enjoy and we will see you very soon.